and I'll put us on screen. Cool. Hey everyone, welcome to the Profit Academy podcast. We're here to show you that it doesn't matter where you started or where you're going with your business. With us, you will find people that have been there and can show you how it's done. We want to make sure you know that anything is possible and to help you realize your potential because you owe it to yourself and you owe it to the world to be the best version of you. So join us here at the Profit Academy and let us help make that happen. All right, all right, all right. I hope that you enjoyed our snazzy new inf intro video. I'm very happy with it. So that's all I really care about. But you know, <laughs> if you like, if you like it too, that's a great little bonus. But I'm here today with our. Well, first of all, once somebody gets on, let me know if they can see us and hear us. If you can't hear us, I don't know how you can follow that particular direction. But you know, hopefully you can. Uh, I am here today with Stephen Black. Steven does content marketing and he takes a really unique approach from it and he's leveraged it into an Amazon FBA business and some other things. So I'm going to let him talk a little bit about what he, who he is and what he does. And we'll go from there. Steven, can you hear me? How's it going? Yeah, Chris, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. So yeah, um, I, uh, I am, uh, a copywriter and a content marketer first and foremost. Um, I'm the guy that across multiple channels, tries to to work the entire segment of the buyer's journey. I, I want to bring people in and actually give them something to talk about other than a product, uh, keep the enthusiasts and all their, their, their passion pursuits in front of me, because if I can keep touching them, who are they going to buy from? They're going to buy from me. And I've leveraged it into multiple businesses over the years. I've been doing it for about 12 or 13 years now. I've had a couple of retail businesses. I've done uh, local lead generation and I have uh, multiple e-commerce brands, both on and off the Amazon platform. So there you go. Great. So you, and you use that to, you talk about Amazon, because that's kind of what I knew you as. Going, yeah. coming into, you use that content to sell like physical products on Amazon or how does that work? Amazon is, is, is one of the channels that I use as one of my distribution points. A lot of people know me uh, for the Amazon space because with the Amazon selling crowd, the Amazon seller crowd, most of them get into selling online through the Amazon platform. And Amazon makes it so easy to sell because it's a system. It's a systematic process. Everything is kind of the same in setting it up. You don't have to worry about a lot of variation and figuring out how you're going to continually get new customers in the funnel because everybody at that goes to Amazon to buy something is already at the bottom of the funnel. They know what they want and they're just going to search and buy. So it's, it's much easier. I just, I happened to start selling on Amazon and I noticed uh, in, in the Facebook forums, nobody was talking about extended marketing. Nobody was talking about buyer's funnels. Nobody was talking about building a captive audience and an actual way to do that. And that's what I've done for forever. And so I just started just sharing my insight and information and one thing led to another. And all of a sudden I talked to thousands of Amazon sellers every week. Uh, just trying to help them say, okay, th the problem with Amazon is when you sell something on Amazon, you don't actually retain any customer information. That frightens me. I don't like that. I want to be able to have an email list. I want to be able to have a community. I want to be able to service people if something happens. So I set it up and I teach you know other people freely in, 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 in the places I post to say, hey, here's how you can actually set up to where you can kind of continually talk to people and then as they want to buy, as they get to the segment of the buyer's journey that they want to buy, if you want them to have them, if you want to have them buy on your site, you can have them buy on your site. But if you want them to buy on Amazon, you can do that too. So everybody that I'm sending to Amazon is already high commercial intent, bottom of the funnel types. Okay. That's, that's how I leverage it. So really Amazon is just a shopping cart in that, mm -hmm. in, in that model. Yeah, the, the way the way that I talk about it is, uh, and 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 kind of part of the bumps that I've taken over the years, I've I've been burned a couple of times and been wiped out a couple of times for having all of my eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. So I always tell people, Amazon may be everybody's favorite cashier, but she can't be the only cashier that works at my store. Because if she has a bad day and she decides to take a walk, I don't want to be out of business just because I I didn't. 
decide to expand my skill set and mitigate that risk by by having other channels available to me. Okay. So the, you we had a conversation right before we came on air yeah. that reminds me of what you just said there. It seems like a lot of your thinking goes into mitigating risk. Is that right? Oh, huge, huge. That's okay. that's a that's a huge part of my whole operation. For me, my mentality is the more the more risk I can mitigate, uh, not necessarily by spreading out just for the sake of spreading out, but by saying, okay, here's a wider range of tools that are available to me for each different task. If it's a checkout point so people can buy, if it's different tools to bring people in, if it's SEO or AdWords or Facebook ads or or uh, generating a following on social media or an email marketing list or whatever. If if I can spread it out and actually manage it, well, now I have more room to take risks with each one because I know if I make a mistake, I'm not wiped out. Okay. Yeah, that's actually like legit is my main business. And that's kind of how that came to be is because I started as, not started, but I was very successful as a freelancer mm -hmm. on another platform. And it started having all sorts of problems. So I started selling myself through my own site because, and I realized, I realized I needed to own something that they couldn't take it away basically. Right. And then I started selling through my own site and that led to legit. So I, I guess I, what I'm saying is I relate to, to what you're saying. Oh man. That, and that that's you, don't, you never want to have like a single point of failure. No. Oh God. And I, I did that. I got wiped out twice, twice as in it was going well. And when you have money coming in, that's great. And all of a sudden you're like, okay, cool. I'm doing it. I'm doing, it, I'm doing it. I'm going to scale. Nope. You have nothing. You go, Oh, I got to start all over. I have mm -hmm. no listing. I have no, I have nothing. I have a, I have a supplier. <laughs> I can do that, but Oh, same goes for your, your traffic source, right? Cause like yep. how often do you in Facebook groups, do you say, Oh, you see, Oh, my ads manager got shut down today for no reason. Which it you know it sounds like in, they're whining sometimes. Sometimes they did stuff they deserve it. Sometimes they really don't. Facebook. Yeah, seems yeah, to no. Facebook. Flip Facebook that switch. goes all over the place. <laughs> and and even if they don't get shut down, Facebook's attribution isn't accurate all the time. You're not going to yeah. get a hundred percent. I find better attribution for my Facebook ads based on UTM tags and Google Analytics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's much that, more accurate. Yeah, I've, I've used Data Studio to track Facebook ads before. They, uh, same here. Same I'm actually here. very very interested in track checking out uh, Alex Becker's product to see how well that works too. But. I, I've heard good things. In fact, uh, I, I was, I was watching one of his conversations yesterday where there was an agency owner that, that mentioned it. And um, Alex is in the same, is, is in the same group. And he's like, here's what it is. Please, please, please go try one of our competitors and have them guarantee the results the way we do. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. if, if you want to know, go ahead and try him, please, please. He's that solid about it. And I, th and the way he talks about it with, with some of the different technicals, I'm like, okay, there's a lot of people that can sell a lot of things, but this guy genuinely knows about how to fix the, the, the missing attribution model. So you can see where the real data is coming from. Yeah. Cause I'm, tracking is a real problem. I find because I do a lot of advertising too. And I know we mostly have an SEO audience here today, but hopefully yeah. they'll, fi they'll find this interesting anyway. And it's very hard to know what's working, especially if you're doing paid ads and organic at the same time. Cause sometimes I'll think an ad's doing really well, but it turns out I'll talk to the person and they'll like, yeah, I was in your Facebook group and, and I searched for how to make duck soup and then I, or some, I'm making stuff. Right. Yeah. And they'll be like, and then I saw the link to your course and I watched it and I signed up. I was like, well, great. But now I don't know if my ad is working or not. Exactly. So tracking is a massive problem in this industry. Exactly. And for me, the way, the way that I separate that out, uh, my system for separating that out, uh, is separate or I, sorry, it's, it's similar across multiple platforms. So if it's Facebook or it's AdWords or, or it's, you know, even if it's coming from one of my social media pages or even a blog, what I'll do is I, I never try to sell at the top of the funnel. I, I don't want anybody to, to worry about being pitched to or, or having a product pushed at them at the top of the funnel. My, my mentality is as a marketer, we only have three things to do. If I have to get strangers to engage with me. I have to get engaged people to buy. And that's where most people stop. But then you have to get the people that have bought and the people that have engaged to continually re-engage for reasons that have nothing to do with the product. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I'm like, okay, if they haven't engaged yet, 
why am I talking about a product? I don't want to try to sell cold people. I, I think that is the same as if I'm walking through the mall and one of those people comes up to me. Hey, can I talk to you for a second? Hey, can I talk to you for a second? I'm like, I don't know. You go away. Yeah. So with all of all of my Facebook ads that I run at the top of the funnel and all of, uh, well, let me start there. I run people to content or I'll run them to a social contest or I'll run them to a quiz to get them to engage because I want to kind of qualify them. Just like if they went to my site, if they went, if they went to a blog, but they never visited my store page or any of my product pages, I might hit them with a retargeting ad, but it's for more content. I'm going to nurture them a little more. I don't want to buy They haven't shown me intent yet. So why am I spending money on trying to commercialize them? Mm -hmm. Same with AdWords. A lot of people, even SEOs I've seen this with, they, they, they fail sometimes to separate how they're running product, targeted keywords that are bottom of the funnel keywords versus mm -hmm. peripheral keywords, right? So if I'm selling a sleep aid, uh, uh, you know, on AdWords, natural sleep aid is a very expensive term, but you know, what's not expensive? Five best sleeping positions, right? People don't think about that. And I'm like, yo, if it costs me, you know, $5 cost per click on natural sleep aid, but it's going to cost me 25 cents, maybe to get someone to click on five best sleeping positions. Cool. They're on my blog. I can pixel them with Facebook. I can hit them with it with a Google tag and, and make a custom audience out of the analytics. I, I can run RLSA ads on AdWords. Easy, mm -hmm. easy, easy. And now I can retarget people and bring them back in. Once they have engaged on a product page or they've clicked a link on my blog or they've, they've, they've clicked one of my pieces of product content. Well, cool. Now I'll hit them with retargeting ads to commercialize them. Yeah. But I let the audience behavior dictate where my effort goes so I don't have to constantly chase a million different lines. It's just, okay, how many different avenues can I use to bring someone in? And that way, like we were talking about with risk mitigation, if I have a platform crash, I'm not worried about it. Like right. this last Black Friday, I knew Facebook was going to take a dump. And mm -hmm. it did because it did it the year before. And just like Amazon on Prime Day in 2018, it took a big dump on everybody. It was like, oh no, what do I do? I'm like, email list, AdWords. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like, we have to have other things. And sure enough, everybody at the back half of 2019 is like, the new theme is, is we're going to go multi-channel. And I'm like, you weren't thinking about that before? Yeah. And honestly, it's, it's like how, how I started following you. I, I had a retail business. I didn't. I, I was good at what I was doing but I knew I had to get more people in and I couldn't afford to run, you know, huge budget paid ads all the time. Cause I, I, I wasn't efficient at it yet, Right. but I knew I could write and I knew my content and I knew my audience really, really, really well. And so I, I found you and a couple other people that made sense of how to run search engine optimization. And man, I, I, I went to the, I, I just went after it. Because I was like, okay, if I'm going to put content out anyway, if I add a couple little, little tiny technicals to it, all of a sudden I'm going to get more visibility organically. Huh. And I, I love hearing how people talk about, oh, or organic is dead. Well, that's just a, a, a code word for saying, I don't want to put in the effort to decode that. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yo, here's the difference. If I have organic as one of my traffic sources and through content marketing and social media advertising and email marketing and SEO. If I'm converting two to one organic to paid, well, guess what? Every $20 acquisition that you make through a paid ad for a customer that that costs me five net. Who's going to scale faster. <laughs> that's what I have. I'm not this. I don't want this to come off. Like I'm like saying like yeah. one or the other better, but that's what I've always kind of preferred about paid traffic is once you crack the, the math formula to it, it's as long as you can learn to put in one dollar and get out two, you can scale it up to the point where it stops working that well. To, which yeah. depends on the size of the audience. You can never do that with SEO traffic. Like, no. Like, and that's that's not to say SEO traffic is not good because that's quote unquote free traffic, and you know it helps with what you were talking about establishing rapport. But you'll never be able to measure it as well. And I think that no. a, lot of, a lot of SEOs overlook that. So, and so a lot of SEOs also seem to have this perception that 
it's almost like a ego thing, like a pay, like yeah. a battle. And they also think that for whatever reason, they think that search traffic converts better. I don't agree with that at all either, but. Well, I, 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 I would interject there. I would say it depends on what conversion you're talking about, because if you're only talking about buy something and that's the only conversion, okay, that, that is one type of conversion. But if I have uh, content that I can make go viral or a blog article where I can get loads and loads of shares, or I can run a social contest. And one of the ways to get more entries into the contest is by sharing the article. Now I have a lot more reach for way less money than I could get just running paid ads. Mm -hmm. And that's going to bring more people into my audience that I can continually nurture in my groups, on my, my social oh, media yeah. accounts, in my email marketing. That's, that's so easy to do. And that doesn't cost any money. It's just, it's just setting up a drip, it's just setting up drip content. And a lot of people miss that process. But if, oh, if but if, if, if that's, if that's, the direction to go. I mean, I love organic for that. Organic is so, so good for churning the top of the funnel because honestly, if you, the, the thing that, that a lot of people miss, whether they're selling a product as, as, as an established brand or as a service provider, the thing that people miss in the online space, whether they're SEOs or paid guys is they don't touch their, their audience enough. They don't touch them enough. They don't talk to them. They don't know them. They don't give, 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 give. They don't answer direct questions. And honestly, the more you do that, the more you babysit it and the more you touch people and the more accessible you are, the, the more you sell from that audience over and over. I'll tell you, one of the best things I do at the bottom of the funnel that most people don't, I send thank you videos. Mm -hmm. If you if you pick something up, I, I have an app that I use and it just gives me a task list and I can sit right here on my webcam and say, okay, you know, Chris from, from, from the Carolinas bought this. Okay. Boom, 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 boom. Hey, Chris, thanks so much. It's Steven here from blah, blah, blah. Thank you for buying this. It's on its way. Uh, you know, if you need anything, here's, here's our customer service. Here's a Facebook group. We're looking forward to talking to you. Boom. And then you're like, either one of two things is going to happen with that. You're going to say, this guy's full of crap. And you're going to mm -hmm. check me out and say, oh my God, he's not. Or you're going to go to the Facebook group and say, wow, they're actually accessible. When they offer something else that's useful to me, I'm going to buy again because you have that good experience. And if I can continually give that over and over again, that's part of the organic experience. That drives profit. Profit means I take more home and now I can go ahead and scale my paid ads as well. It's so much easier that way when you have both sides running. And we have a question here. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll go read that up. Gil says, oh, what to do if I have released a product on Amazon but don't have knowledge within that niche very well. What would you recommend for making quality content? Got it. That's actually one of my, my, my favorite things to talk about. It's called social listening. So here's what you do. If you don't know anything about the niche, if you're a middle-aged guy from the middle of nowhere, but you are crushing it with makeup products, that's one of my favorite scenarios to go, who I don't have a daughter, but I have a beauty brand that's really crushing it. What do I do as an example? Well, what I want you to do is I want you to go online and find out where the enthusiasts hang out, especially if it's on Facebook, because with Facebook, they actually changed the newsfeed uh, format this last year in 2019 to where it primarily shows what groups you're a part of because people are, have tended to group themselves in enthusiast groups. Now, why do we want to find enthusiasts? With your enthusiasts, these are people that have a passion pursuit within the niche you're selling, and they are going to buy, share, and take action based around that passion pursuit. They buy products to further that hobby. Your product should be one of them. The other two things I would recommend, aside from you know looking up enthusiast groups like on Facebook or people on YouTube or, or Instagram, let's say, Go to Reddit and find subreddits and you can do social listening there and, and, and start answering questions. And, and people will, you'll learn number one, just like, just like we do if, if we're marketers listening to the podcast. We, aren't, we weren't experts at first. We didn't know the language at first, but we read our butts off and we participated and experimented and said, okay, now I know the language. I can answer a few questions. Same thing within your niche. You just got to know where those people hang out, right? If you're a marketer, you can find other marketing groups. If you're in a niche, Go to Reddit and find subreddits. Go to Quora. Quora is fantastic. 
because it's all short answer questions. They have um, a really powerful advertising platform too. I haven't cracked that one yet. I've, I've looked at it. I haven't cracked it yet. Anyway. Um, and face, Facebook enthusiast group skill, that's where you go. Go to uh, and, and, and find social listening. I have a, a template that I use to say, okay, here's what the enthusiasts are talking about. Here's what they're interested in. And honestly, what I do when I'm vetting a product that I'm selling on Amazon or consider selling on Amazon, I'm not going to buy the inventory yet. I'm going to go to the enthusiast groups first, like a chameleon and say, hey, I'm looking for something you know, like this, but that also has this. And what I'll do is I'll leave a link to one of one of the one of the competitors that I may have, or a listing I'm trying to emulate, or a product that gave me the idea for my product. And I'll say, hey, have you seen something like this, but that also has this other thing? I'm kind of looking for something like that. And most people will say, oh, well, yeah, there's this other product. It's really, really great. This company makes it. Boom. Now, now you know where to go with that. Uh, or they'll say, oh no. If you find something like that, let me know. Aha, now you're on the right path. That's just vetting a product because you understand how to talk to the enthusiasts. Simple as that. If you sell something that is for people that are like ultra marathoners, let's say you have some kind of special knee brace. Well, go and do that. Go and find all that. So though that's how I would vet all of that. Okay. Great advice. <laughs> and what I like, I'm going to put that on the screen in case anybody missed the question. What I like that you said about that is that you're not just looking at some number. You know? yeah. I, I think a lot of marketers and SEOs in particular like to look at like keyword planning tools and mm -hmm. what, you know, all these things. And they, they forget to just think about what the person might do. You know what I mean? Like they forget that yeah. they're to be human for lack yeah, of a better I, I like I like to go and I like to ask questions. I like to play dumb. Because here's the thing, especially with social media, you have to understand it's a psychology thing. People have an addiction to being significant. That's a big statement. People have an, have an addiction to being significant, especially amongst their peers. How many marketers that are listening to this podcast have a bit of an ego and we love when we put the value bomb out there and we get like a million likes? We all love that. We have an addiction to being significant. So if you go to your niche and you say, hey, guys, um, I'm looking for something like this or I, 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 this is kind of my situation. How would I use this? <laughs> You're suggesting the use of a product like yours or a situation like like somebody would use your product to the group so they can tell you, oh, well, well, this and that and the other. And I've used this for this and that for that. And this is kind of how I would use that. And, you know, what are you doing now? And, let them tell you all the reasons that they would use it and buy it. And guess what? That's what you use in your marketing because those are the points that people are talking about. And they want to talk about uh, with, and with other people that are going through a passion, like, like a passion pursuit. Hey, how many makeup groups do you see where people are talking about the different makeup tips and the little different selfie videos they have? If you're a middle-aged dude selling beauty products and you don't know anything about it, <laughs> Like you say, okay, how do I talk? I'm a middle-aged white dude. I want to talk to girls about makeup. I'm not going to be doing a lot of makeup with, with this right here. I got a face for radio, baby. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe you should do some. Well, you get the point, <laughs> right? <laughs> but that's that's how I would do that. I hope I hope that makes sense. If 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 that if that helps. Um cool. so our next question comes from Vladimir. He says, tell us more about new website CRO features. And he has features in quote, what will and won't work in 2020? Ah, conversion rate optimization. Okay. Uh, the biggest thing, uh, the th I'm going to address the back end of the question first. What really works has always worked. There are no gimmicks that have changed. There's, there's not any kind of loophole or something that, that used to work that now, that, that now isn't going to work. So it's like this. Honestly, the more self-evident you can make the processes on your site or any behavioral action you're trying to get someone to take, the better it's going to be. As an example, if you pull up the Google homepage, you know within one second what to do there. Mm -hmm. If you pull up the Yahoo homepage, you go, oh God, way too many choices way too many choices. All right. So when you want someone to take an action, make your website incredibly easy to navigate. 
Do not fill it with a bunch of clutter. Make it incredibly easy. Make it incredibly self-evident. Um, test all of your copy in a program like Grammarly or Readable or the Hemingway app. Look at your Flesh Kincaid score. Keep it uh, between grades six and eight where people read Harry Potter. That's where the magic happens because people can actually understand that. They don't have to overthink it. They're not going to see a big word and think they're too dumb. All right, because the worst thing that can happen that there's only there's only one process that kills your conversion rate one, and that's click scan back. That's what happens if people click on your website and they can't scan it and immediately get the idea. They're going to click back, and the next person down the Google list or the next result, you know, in 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 Facebook or whatever, they're going to go. They're going to check it out if they're on if they're on Amazon, same thing. So that's that's the idea there. That's the idea as far as conversion rate optimization. Um, I, and also, I would segment your conversion rate efforts to the various parts of your operation and website. You do not need it to be complicated. Is your menu easy to navigate? Are things easy to find? Um, or is, is your blog very clearly labeled versus your store? Right? A great great website to look at that is super simple, but does mid eight figures every year because they have a very, very smart marketer behind them. Uh, go to the beauty site, boom by Cindy Joseph. That's C I N D Y J O S E P H. That's Ezra Firestone's beauty brand, mm. right? Yeah. He's, yeah, he's, he's sharp. And it's super simple to understand. Another pro tip. If you want to do conversion rate optimization, Holy crap, add humans to your website. Add a picture of yourself. Add pictures of other people. In your email marketing, add a picture of yourself. People like doing business with other people. It, it boosts your conversion rate real fast. Another thing you can check out, um, you uh, check out Browser Stack. Browser Stack is fantastic if you've not heard of it. It's an app that you can go and check out how your landing pages, how your site, how everything looks across multiple operating systems and multiple devices all at once. So if you're running ads and somebody's on like an iPhone 7 on an old operating system and they can't click your add to cart button, yikes, you're not going to convert any there. So it's a great, great thing to check out and say, okay, if I'm on Safari or if I'm on Firefox or if I'm on a desktop versus a tablet versus this phone browser stack has all of that easy way to do that there. Um, that that's, that's the best way I would, I, the simple stuff I would say about that. Also, last thing, make your text on your site bigger than you think it should be. That's something I've done. I, I use like a size 18 font a lot of the yep. time. It really makes a big difference. Huge. I used difference. to get a lot of complaints about people not being able to read it and stuff. And I'm like, it's free. And I just, you know, I have, what, I, what I decided to do was deal with it the way it is rather than the way I thought it should be. And I made right. the change. Right. So. The, the last thing, the last thing I would say about that is if you're doing email marketing, use big letters in your email marketing. Yeah. Especially, especially if you're, you're marketing something that, that may have an older demographic, like even like pet products, it's not 20 something girls buying pet products. It's seniors. Make your email have a great big font on it so they can say, ah, well, this is so much easier to read. Oh, click here. Yeah, sure. I'll click. No problem. Great. Like that, that intuitive business, making it easier to read. That's, that's the idea. Great answer. So our next question comes from, uh, this is from YouTube. It's from Ilker. He says, how much to burn to learn Facebook ads? I, it's, there's no real answer to any any question that's how much or how many or how long, there's no, there's never an answer, but I don't know. I would, I don't even know where to begin. Do you want to, you want to take I, a stab? I, I can, I can take a stab. I can take a stab. As, as Chris said, um, learning Facebook ads. Uh, if you are learning to be profitable to some degree, that's going to take a bit. If you're learning to be able to scale, that's a different stage. If you don't have the fundamentals down, as fundamentals, then you're never going to be able to scale those fundamentals. Everybody wants to run Facebook ads and say, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to spend, a, you know, $3,000 a day and a hundred grand a month. Okay, cool. That's, that's, that's your ego. But 
it's only because you can scale the fundamentals that are in place. What I would recommend is instead of taking a vacation to Vegas this year and spend your $3,000, don't take the vacation. Take the $3,000, put it in a separate account. Open a separate bank account with a separate card and say, okay, what are the fundamentals of Facebook ads? Here's the buyer's journey. Cold, engaged, abandoned carts, and post-purchase. Simple as that. Just keep it simple and say, okay, how do I use Facebook ads and my content and creatives and my site to solve the problem of each one of those phases? That's it. As, as you go down and you can say, okay, how can I get people engaged more profitably? Let's solve that problem. How can I get my engaged people to buy more profitably? Let's solve that problem. And that way you're not chewing into your business opera, uh, operating income. You can say, I've got this part over here. I was going to burn it on vacation or in Vegas anyway. I'm going to learn Facebook ads instead because everything you do for the first time is going to suck. It's going to mm -hmm. be terrible. It's going to be awful. It's going to hurt. But what you have to understand is that's the fastest way to make money is to, is to fail fantastically. And this circles back to the first thing we were, we were talking about, which is risk mitigation. When I want to experiment with something new, I cut money out and I say, you know what? I absolutely know that I may lose every single penny here, but that's how much I'm willing to lose. When the card runs out because the, the amount in the account runs out with it, I'm done. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have the stress of trying to be profitable because I'm trying to do something new that's actually killing my current business that's working. I'll add to the answer too. It, Facebook ads isn't necessarily a thing you learn. It, and what I mean by that is it, there's a lot of different stuff you can do. If you're doing like for local businesses, like Billy Jean is marketing type Facebook ads that he teaches, not that he does. And then that's yeah much different than what I have to do with like a gigantic marketplace, like legit, that gets really, really technical. And then that's different than what you would do if you're selling, you know, I don't, I don't know, whatever physical, I don't buy enough stuff to give good examples, whatever physical product people are buying. So it's just there's, the point to that my, I'm trying to make is there's so many different, it's not. I will say answer. that there, there is one thing you have to know. There is one secret that is a dead, big, huge secret to Facebook ads. If you want Facebook ads to work, understand that ads manager is 1% of how Facebook ads work. That makes sense. Everything else, your customer experience, your website loading time, all the things that would affect your conversions like on SEO and organic traffic, it's the same with Facebook ads. All it is is a different mechanism to bring people in to your ecosystem. If your ecosystem is not there, then your ads aren't going to work. It's not like Facebook ads, all of a sudden I'm going to run things and print money. All Facebook ads are, are a way to push money into a platform and accelerate your distribution. That's it. That's all it is. So if your fundamentals aren't there, if your website takes eight seconds to load, Facebook ads aren't going to work. If your creatives are a mess and are confusing, are uninviting, if, you're, if your pictures are, are like a 19... 99 Motorola flip phone kind of pictures, not going to work. So understand Facebook ads are just a way to accelerate the distribution point or sorry, the distribution of, you know, whatever you're, you're, you're trying to use as a lead magnet to draw people in, but that's all it is. All right. Great. All right. Next question comes from Marcel. Marcel says, hi, Steven. Imagine you have, you might want to scooch up a little bit for this one. <laughs> hi, Steven. Imagine you have several products or brands in different product categories. What can you do to be credible for your target audience and people see you as an expert? I people see your personal name, not brand name in different groups. Uh -huh. No problem. Who says that, who says what defines an expert? Why can't you just be genuine? You say, look, I know this about this and I don't know this about the other. We like, like if, if there's a super serious technical SEO question, I don't know. Chris is going to have to help answer. I have no idea. If I have something where someone's going to ask me um, something, you know, really, really, really deep uh, about attribution windows and Facebook ads, I have an idea. I know what I do, but I'm not the guy to ask. I can point you to the guy to ask. So mm -hmm. as far as different product categories, I run multiple different product brands. I you're not the you're not the lone face you're the one providing information and information comes in two forms you either create content or you curate content 
Don't be afraid to say, hey guys, you know, I found this really cool article. What do you guys think? This is my journey. This is, this is what I'm doing. You know, here we go. What people really want, if they're going to buy into a brand, is they want a great customer experience. Most people do not spend the time saying, you know, all, all the hours necessary to say, this is the ideal boutique, crazy product for me. Most people, especially like with Amazon, most people are going to go on and say, I know what I'm looking for. I'm going to try to find something that matches what I'm looking for, but has the least opportunity to be awful when it arrives. And so if you can give a great brand experience and touch people and continue to give them information that helps further their passion pursuit, who says you have to be a PhD of each subject? You just can be passionate about multiple things. I'm passionate about plenty of things. I absolutely love writing. I love writing. Like some people like to go and, and go golfing. Give me a keyboard. Give me my, my, my readable app. I am a happy puppy all day. I like mythology. I like computers. I like, you know, technical video stuff like talking about, um, you know, different bit rates for different codecs and different cameras when, when doing video content. I'm a geek like that. I can circle in all those different enthusiast groups and share insight and information. But that doesn't mean that you know, if you wanted to sell video equipment, you have to be a Hollywood movie director before you can open your mouth. Mm -hmm. the, the difference th that you have is that, and this is where you, you'll fail if you run multiple brands. If you're an egotistical goofball and you, you try to position yourself that you know everything about a brand or everything about a niche, well, then that's, that's the problem. It, it's okay to say, okay, well, that's a great question. I have no idea. Let's find out. Mm. It humanizes you. You're not going to know everything. So stop trying to, 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 to put yourself out there that just because you sell something within a niche and maybe you make a great product and you have a great company that you know everything about it. If, if you really want to know about this, go read the story of how Henry Ford ran his business. He didn't know anything about cars, but he had a million people around him where he could press a button. And if you asked a question, the right person would walk in the room and answer the question for you. And he built a beautiful business and a beautiful you know, operation out of it. There you go. All right, think, think about Procter & Gamble. You think the higher-ups at Procter & Gamble with all the brands that they own know everything about all their brands? Nope. No. And don't be afraid of having other people as brand ambassadors. Don't be afraid of that. Just, just because you're circling different things, it, 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 so what? There's, there's a lot of people I know with multiple YouTube channels, as example, on all kinds of different subjects. But they don't claim to know everything. They just claim to be enthusiasts about different things. Don't be afraid of that. Great answer. All right. Our next question comes from Rizzo's Salon. Rizzo's Salon. I don't know to say if he or she. Stephen, what do you think of influencer marketing? I think uh, you have to be careful with influencer marketing. You have to absolutely properly vet the influencers uh, because people have realized they can be paid uh, just because a lot of people pay attention to numbers on a profile. Uh, how many likes they're getting or how many followers they have. Um, but realistically, what's the real engagement numbers? What can I really expect for conversions? Um, and does the person's content match the feel of what I want my brand image to be? Because if you're going to hire another spokesperson to be an ambassador for your brand, uh, and, and the way that they conduct themselves outside of your promotional content on their page isn't a way you would want them to, 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 to display your company as an in-house employee. Be careful with the influencers. Be very, very careful. There are, um, there are some great tools uh, that, that I have, have, have used before. I'm going to look them up for you real quick just so I can name a few off the top of my head. Uh, and I actually, I, I wrote up a, a, a piece on this. Hold on just one second. Um, not that one. Um, yeah, but I'll rattle off a few programs you can check out real quick. Um, so that, da, 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 why is that not working?
Um, that's very, very strange. I will rattle them off in just a second, Rizzo. Uh, take me, take me to the next question, and I'll come back. I'll circle back for Rizzo. All right. Uh, Ron says, "Spitting real stuff right here." God, I hate when people take ads for granted, like it's the missing piece in their business. Totally agree. That's right. Uh, next one looks like an SEO question. Oh boy. Charles says, what's the best way to get a client in Google Maps when they, and this is covering up both of our faces. That's okay. <laughs> when they don't have, oh, that was more for the audience. When they don't have a location in that city. I've done the following. Google, my business is robust with geotag map, geotag pics and services with long tail keyword. I, you shouldn't put your keyword on a public thing like this. But uh, anyhow, the website's homepage has the long tail keyword. I have built good long form content on high authority websites. Okay, so here, I'm going to move this off the screen because it's taking gotcha. both our faces. But the answer you're probably not going to like it is if you're trying to rank in Google Maps for a place where you don't have a location, you shouldn't be ranking in Google Maps there. I know that a lot of people want to do that, but the whole point of Google Maps is to help local people find local businesses. That said, it can be done. Can it be? You're probably going to either need to get a location in that city, or you're going to need to get a fake location in that city. Uh, whether it's like a fake GMB or whether it's a, you know, a virtual office or something like that. But the truth is yeah. you, you aren't supposed to be able to do that. Yeah. What, I, to, to add to that last sentence you just said, one of the things that, that, that I've done and, and other people have done as well, uh, there are services that will, will, act as a physical address for you. And they'll even collect mail for you at a certain address. Mm -hmm. And then, and then forward it to you. So you can actually have a physical verifiable address. So like when you go uh, to have the business verified and Google sends you out the postcard, like they still do. So you have to put in the code and actually verify things. It can go to that physical address. Google can say, okay, we sent it to this address that's local. Even if it gets forwarded to whomever, wherever you need to be, that's, right. that's how I would run that. And that way, as far as Google sees it, you have a physical address within the locale. Yeah. Now, that's not really what you're looking for because you're trying to rank one location in two locations. And Oh, sorry. Uh, I misunderstood. No, 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 no. I, I answered the same way you did. But I just want to let it know that what you want to do where you have the one GMB and you want to show up in two different locations, probably not going to be possible unless they're close enough together and this, there's a small enough population in one of the suburbs. But like... Other than that, probably not going to work the way you want it to, unfortunately. So next question comes. Ooh. Pause for a sec. Pause for a sec. We got to go back to Rizzo for a second with the influencer thing. All right. So go Rizzo, ahead. you asked about influencers. Um, here's a few tools uh, if, if, if you wanted to take notes. These are platforms where you can actually check out influencers, check out their real stats, uh, check out, you know, if, if you did a campaign with them, is it going to pay off, blah, 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 that kind of thing. Um, clear with a K. K L E A R. That's a great platform. Is that dot com? Uh, I think so. Okay. I think so. Um, da -da -da -da, uh, tracker with two A's. T R A A C K R is another one. Um, Upfluence is very, very popular. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, a one, one that's really, really great that auto filters out fake accounts. So you can see like actual post consistency and growth rates. One that I like a lot is a uh, Heepsy, H E E P S Y, and they have a database of like like six or seven million influencers, uh, and all the influencers have more than five thousand fans. So there's actual substance there. So you can and they fill they they filter out junk. So if they see like somebody getting just like oh, it's only smiley faces from the same few people, like they're a part of a pod, well, that's a fake account. They're going to weed those people out. But uh, he Heapsy is where I would go to look for that kind of stuff too. All, so right. All right. So let's see. We were on Ron C after Charles Davis. Ron says, you need all the pieces of the puzzle, acquiring and converting customers. Agreed. I think that's the same question from Marcel from before. Well, maybe not. Hi, Steven. I would like to sell different products in different product categories. How can I be credible for people when... No, I think we already read that. No, we, we talked about the first part of that. He added to it. Okay. Should I engage with people not using my own first and last name in a Facebook group and use a brand name instead, which is less personal though? Or should I hire a VA for each product? Definitely not a VA. 
uh, I'm going to take that off the screen because it's covering itself. Yeah. But okay, so the 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 the, the boil down question is: Do I talk to people as myself or as a brand? Um, what what I would do is if if you're in a group, uh, I would always talk as yourself. Do not be afraid. And you know what? If somebody calls you out and says, wait a minute, you have this other thing going on over here, which, you know, what's the deal? And you can't have more than one business. Like, and it, honestly, if, if you're being genuine with the information that you're giving and you're not just blowing smoke just to blow smoke, like if you're actually talking about something that you understand and you're sharing information that you understand, cool. Let them, let them check it out. Like I can, I can talk about content marketing and Amazon and AdWords, right? It, and I can even do email marketing. I talk about copywriting. So what? Those are all very, very different groups. And I'm not going to go in and try to be some fake expert. I'm just going to talk about what I know. Um, I, I, you know, I know about the fitness industry. I know about, uh, you know, uh, the, the PC building enthusiast crowd. I know about filmmaking. You're going to see my name in all those groups. If I have products across multiple groups, so what? And check me out. It's 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 totally, totally fine. Not a problem at all. Don't be afraid of that. And here's, here's what I think about. If you are an enthusiast, let's say you're you're wanting to get into bodybuilding, right? That's that's a huge, like very, very tight-knit enthusiast crowd. Uh, and they are ridiculous with each other if you're a fake person. Whew, they're brutal. Right. <laughs> so if you go into one of those crowds and, and you're like wanting to sell hawk a fitness product or that kind of thing. Okay. Do you want to get fitness tips or have a relationship where you're asking advice from a person or do you want to get tips from, you know, um, let's say Jupiter fitness company. The Jupiter Fitness Company page workout tips. Well, See, I'm going to step away for just a sec. Go right ahead. Go right ahead. Totally fine. Totally, totally fine. Take this call. Totally fine. Do you want to get tips from somebody that you can actually ask questions to? Or do you want to get tips from like the, a Jupiter Fitness page? How do you know that those tips are legit? How do you know that the information you're getting from a brand isn't altruistic? In other words... If you get information from somebody and and putting your 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 face out there and putting your name there, it's more trustworthy than hiding behind some brand name where it could be anybody posting. I hope I hope that that makes sense. Um, and that's that's how I would do it. I have eight different brands online, and I run social media followings for all of them, and my face is on all of them, and I have been at this over 10 years, 12 or 13 years or something like that. Um, but I think maybe once, maybe twice out of all of that, I've had somebody question. So, you know, I saw you over here. So yeah, that's one of the other things that I'm into. Sure. No problem. What, what's, what's your question? It, it's, it, don't, don't sweat it. It's, it's not going to be that big a deal. As long as you are genuine with what you know and what you don't, you'll be just fine. Great. Sorry about that. I not a problem. Had, a, had a call that could have been an emergency that was not. <laughs> so, well, I don't. Now I'm going to have to have a talk with somebody later. But anyhow, uh, let's see. Ilker says, how many percentage of Amazon sellers are driving external traffic? I will comment on that before Stephen does and say probably not many because I know I know someone who runs a very successful a bookstore on Amazon and that's his entire income. And he relies, relies solely on the traffic that he gets from Amazon. So, which is great. I mean, he's doing well, but I talked to him about it. I was like, Hey, have you ever tried like YouTube video? Have you ever tried it? It's kind of, he's like, no, I don't do any of that. I'm like, okay. So a lot of very few Amazon sellers. <laughs> and honestly, the people that do an external traffic, very, very few. I'm like 1% of 1% of people actually run traffic uh, as far as a real buyer's journey. Most of the people that are running uh, external traffic are running uh, rebates or discounts or something like that. And it's all product focused uh, or it is, is promotion focused. They're not actually trying to build um, a complete buyer's journey. 
Um, and you have to realize if you have an e-commerce website, as example, uh, most, most people that run like a Shopify store, a decent conversion rate is somewhere around, you know, two to 4% is, is what the average is for a retail Shopify store. Conversion rates on Amazon are like 15 to 20%. So it's much, much higher. So people can go ahead and make a living on that, on that systematic, uh, systematic platform versus having to worry so much about external traffic. Now, the people that do run external traffic and that actually know how to run external traffic, you can't compete with it because I'm not competing for the same buyer pool you are. Like there's nothing you can, if, if I decide and I have a full operation running that I want to be part of a niche, there's nothing you can do to stop me because I'm not dependent on a single platform. And that means I don't have to play by the same rules you do. It's one of the reasons I've been a lot, I don't want this to come off vain, but I've had more success than some people in SEO that are trying to do the, some, some of the same things I'm doing is because I'm not relying just on SEO traffic and I advertise my SEO stuff on Facebook. Sure. That gets me a troll in the Facebook ads from time to time. If SEO is so great, why do you have to use Facebook ads? I was like, right. why, why would I limit my, I don't respond to those people, but right. I mean, why would I limit myself to any one thing? You know? Right, exactly. I mean, like, and, that's like saying to McDonald's, why are you advertising on TV if going into your business isn't it? Well, here, any, anybody that's ever felt like that, point of fact, if you're watching this on, uh, on online right now on Facebook, why aren't you listening to it on the podcast only? Mm. Be in multiple places. Be yeah. able to, I mean, here's the thing. We're on we Facebook all, and YouTube right now. Exactly. Well, there you go. That's the thing. And honestly, as we consume information, Everybody has a preference as to how they like to consume information. I'm one of the weirdos that hasn't watched television literally in 20 years. I have a library. I like hard books. I won't read a Kindle. I don't like it. I like to consume information with hard books. Simple as that. But if I'm giving information, I have a blog. I have a Facebook group. I have Instagram. There's YouTube. There's podcasts. There's all kinds of places that I want to take my information and repopulate it. Gary V, the very, very famous, you know, guy that everybody is, is, is listened to his whole thing. If you boil down everything he talks about to like one point, it's be enthusiastic, make content about what you about, whatever your, your, your enthusiasm is in your niche and get it as many places as you possibly can, because you never know who's going to come in and convert. Mm -hmm. that, that's Gary V boiled down and that's it. It's that simple. Same. All right. Uh, Marcel says, awesome. Thanks for your answer, Stephen. I really appreciate it. Great value. Glad to help. Glad to help. Got another one from Gil. Gil says about the first question of mine you answered. I'm gonna have to try to remember what that was. I'm a guy selling a woman's product, a women's product. I'd love to show my face to make more of a personal connection with a consumer, but can't do so, feel like it's hurting my business. What do you think would be the best solution? I would hire a woman to be the face of your brand and probably. I'll let you Here's take the thing. it too. But. So what, what you, what you want to do, what you want to do, uh, Ezra Firestone, brilliant guy, uh, is, is, is not going to be a model for women's products. But <laughs> is, is, I mean, he's is, is a brilliant guy, love him to death. Um, but he, he is no, going to be no better as a makeup model than, than this nastiness right here would. <laughs> right. But if you look at the brand I mentioned before, boom by Cindy Joseph, look at, look at, um, what he, what he's done for the imagery. He has a spokeswoman for his, uh, for his brand that he's partnered with mm -hmm. very, very, very simple to do. If you have a missus, if you have, you know, uh, an assistant or, or, or somebody that works with you, that is any version of, of a, a non leper woman, you'll be okay. And she doesn't even have to be the person talking in the camera. She can sit next to you. Hey, it's Gil and Jessica here from Gil's beauty brand. Just having one of them next to you legitimizes you that you're not a creep to all the women you're trying to sell to. That's assuming Gil's not a creep. I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt here. <laughs> I'm just, just playing Gil. 
All right. Leanne says, how about marketing your products in Amazon and Google affiliates review? Mm -hmm. sites? Yes. So I guess what she's asking is, do you do affiliate sites to get to your Amazon products? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, one of the things that I, I'm going to actually, uh, use some SEO stuff with this. I like to do that. So Leanne, what I would do, uh, if you want to find out, uh, more review sites or something like that, that are relevant to your product niche that maybe some of your competitors are using, I want you to use an advanced search operator on Google with your main keywords. So let's say you're selling uh, fitness bands as an example, go to Google and type in uh, fitness bands, and then I want you to add a qualifier. Type in fitness bands, and then use minus site colon amazon.com. And that's called an advanced search operator. And what that's gonna do, it's gonna bring up all the results for that keyword that are not on the Amazon platform. Take your top 10 competitors, put in their brand name. Mm. Put in the brand name and the keyword, and put in that search operator, and that search operator is no space. It's, it's minus site colon amazon.com and that will exclude the amazon.com website from the search results. And that way you'll be able to see what brand names, uh, what brand, or sorry, uh, what, what your, your branded competitors are doing as far as other review sites and other affiliate sites and all this other kind of thing. And that way you can reach out to those affiliate and review sites too, and use that traffic. Same thing with having a YouTube influencer. You'll see a lot of people that uh, run affiliate offers to books on Amazon. Very, very popular with the stuff that I watch. Uh, and they'll say, hey, links in the bio, there you go. Or click on this and, and you know, here's the code. Boom. Absolutely a great idea. You should absolutely be using that as one of your sources of traffic. You could also have your own affiliate site, right? Like you can promote rank for your own products. I mean, I've never yeah. done it. I don't do Amazon, but if I did, I would absolutely do that because why wouldn't I take up the first page? <laughs> Yeah. So our next question comes from Vladimir. Vladimir says, talking about GMB, do you have any insights on writing posts in GMB? Does it help ranking? So it probably isn't the magic bullet that a lot of SEOs are pretending that it is, but it could be a tiebreaker. If you have everything else right, your fundamentals, your GMB optimized citations, all that great stuff, and everybody else does too, then that could be a tiebreaker. And it's still worth doing for the customer part of it. As far as ranking, I think the impact is not zero, but is not, but is minimal. Uh, Charles, he's still asking about the GMB ranking in the different cities. He says he's it's the first time he's not been able to do it with it for this client. He's done it 15 times without a fake address. I can't just pinpoint what he missed. Um, I don't know. It sounds like there's a proximity issue. Maybe the competition is, I, I'd have to see the specific case. I don't, I'm not hundred percent sure what to tell you. Uh, let's see. Weight lose expert says, supposing you had the option to choose one anchor text of these website, click here or site name.com, which would you go with? I mean, there's times when you would use any of those. Yeah, that's very mm -hmm. situational. Can you clarify for us so we yeah. can, we can give a you a better answer? A bit more context. Uh, Marcel says, thanks, Stephen. Makes perfect sense. Very helpful. Let's see. Steven, do you see it happen that Amazon would let you use their pixel so we can retarget people? Absolutely not. Now, nah, pause. Pause, pause, pause. If you are trademarked and you have brand registry on Amazon, when, in whatever marketplace you're selling in, you can apply for a program called Amazon Attribution. Now, it is not like Facebook where they can, uh, or, or, or Tag Manager, where they come to your website and you can build a custom audience to retarget. But instead, what you can do is you can finally see with the Amazon attribution program where your sales are coming from. That's important to talk about. So if I'm, if I have a link coming from, you know, my blog site or an affiliate site or a Facebook ad or an AdWords link, I can see in the Amazon attribution dashboard, where that sale came from, it links it back for me. Does that mean you can pixel the site um, and 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 retarget people? No. One of the things, if you want to try it, I have I I don't do this anymore, 
uh, use a, a link tracker like Sniply, snip.ly. Uh, and what that'll allow you to do is you can actually put a, a pixel in the link to any site you don't own, like Amazon in this instance. And if you wanted to, you can make a custom audience from people that clicked on that link. And if you can retarget them, if you yeah. want, that's you have the to only a lot of traffic through that link before it would make a big enough audience. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of people clicking, and especially if your average click through rate, let's say from a Facebook ad, let's say you're really cooking and it's like 3% click through rate. Well, that's three out of every hundred people that see it. Yeah. So you need man. tens of thousands of people. To get man, that. you gotta, you yeah, gotta have some budget that. for that one. Yeah. Better, better ways to spend that money. Wouldn't a better way if you wanted to retarget people that you're selling on Amazon to be to have a bridge page in between like a landing page where you, you know, you drive, I mean, this is for the people listening, you know, you drive them from your Facebook ad or your Google ad or whatever to a landing page and then you retarget them. And that, that seems like that would probably be the best. Yes. Route. Yeah. Yes. Now I've it's actually, funny. I, I gave a talk in March of last year and there's lots of different tools that we use for different processes in SEO world or in Facebook or whatever. And on Amazon, my favorite tool for Amazon is Shopify. And people are like, huh? Usually try to go one or the other. No, you don't. Because if I can drive people to a blog page or to my store, if I know the conversion rates affect my ranking on Amazon, I want to protect my conversion rate, which means if I can allow people to check out on my website, and then use Amazon as a parallel uh, sales page, right? As a parallel sales port. Now all of my high commercial intent people, like my abandoned checkouts, my abandoned carts, um, all of those kind of types, I can run a retargeting ad to those custom audiences and I can split test it back to my store or I can say, hey, check out now on Amazon, save a dollar and get it in two days through the Prime experience. That added leverage for the Amazon platform you can get a lot of clicks on your ad through there and you're not giving them a huge discount, are you? It's a perceived discount. They can check out faster. It's a more reliable platform because everybody uses it. You've now leveraged the benefits of Amazon while also still having people in a custom audience to continually rework over and over and over again. That's like that's how I would use a bridge page, but I would take it further and say, I want a bridge page where I can filter for commercial intent before I send people to Amazon. Great answer. Great. Yeah, I, uh, I use the bridge page for retargeting trick a lot. Like even on like my, uh, my delivery messages on like, legit and then other platforms I was previously on, I would say, join our private Facebook mastermind here. And it would take them over to like a squeeze page where the whole point of that was just to make them get to the squeeze page to go, I can target them. And then they would click the button and just join the Facebook, go over to the Facebook group. So I made it seem like, and I'm giving this away to people that pro I probably got to know that way, <laughs> but <laughs> and I, that was the whole point of that was to make them make first, it makes it feel a little more exclusive, but it also, so I could retarget them later. So that was kind of the same. What made me think of that for Amazon? So uh, let's see. Well, Golden Nugget. Thanks again, Stephen. Uh, can you name three books to read? Can I name three books to read? Uh, yes. Um, I would read um, Breakthrough Advertising by Eugene Schwartz, if you haven't read that one. That's really expensive, but... <laughs> uh, well, it, 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 oh, it is, yeah. well, here's the thing. If, if you try to buy it used on Amazon, it's a few hundred dollars. Um, if you go to the, the website, breakthrough advertising uh, the guy that used to, uh, the guy that was the VP for boardroom Inc where Eugene Schwartz was a copywriter, he owns the rights to the book now. And that's where you can buy a brand new copy. So breakthrough advertising book.com is where you get that one. Uh, and that's going to be the most expensive thing I tell you to get, uh, secondarily, uh, I would get um, Alchemy by Rory Sutherland. And Rory Sutherland is the vice president for Ogilvy UK, which if you've not heard of Ogilvy uh, Advertising Agency, they're the biggest. <laughs> they have been for a long time. Uh, but what he studies is a lot of what I study, which is behavioral psychology and how that affects people's uh, buying behaviors. And it, he talks about, you know, usability and customer service and blah, 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 blah. Uh, and the last book I would tell you to get is a book called Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug. 
K-R-U-G. And Steve Krug is a usability expert. He goes through websites and makes them easier to use, tells you where you're missing, tells you what better practices to use for optimizing the entirety of your online experience for the end user. You get those three going, now you're going to understand better copywriting, which is honestly the fundamental of marketing. You get copywriting right, you understand marketing, right? Now you have some psychology involved and you have your usability optimization. Those three, if you get those moving, you'll you'll start to see a real, real difference there. Great. All right. Boom is a case study. I don't know what that means. If you look at the, if you look at the website and start following it and get on their email, your your funnel hacking, as it were, check that one out. That's a great one to look at, especially for uh, conversion rate optimization, because they only have like three or four products, but they do like twenty or thirty million dollars a year out of that store. Hmm. It's ridiculous. Vladimir says, "Are you driving?" I think we kind of answered this, but we'll go through. We it did, again. we did, we we already we co we covered that one. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Marcel says, Stephen, what's your opinion towards using Amazon products links in your Shopify store? That way we can get their email address first and let them buy the product in your Shopify store, which lands to the Amazon listing page. My, I'm going to let Stephen answer that, but my take on that is that it's making it too complicated. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't do that. Uh, you have to, you have to choose if, if you have, uh, like, um, a more product centric blog article, let's say, or piece of content, then if you want to put the link to Amazon, you certainly can. Uh, I prefer to have them check out on Shopify because I've, I've, I still have that card to play if they don't check out where I can leverage the benefits of Amazon as far as platform trust and shipping times and all that kind of thing. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, additionally, I would rather them buy on my store because I want to get people in my post-purchase audience segment with full information in my database. And you don't get that with Amazon. So there's my answer there. All right. Wild Snipply link strategy is golden. Thanks, Stephen. I've used Snipply for other things too. It's it's not, it, it's, it's to me, it's one of those things that seems cooler than it actually is. Yeah, it's, it's not perfect either. It's yeah. not perfect either. Yeah. WooCommerce versus Shopify, which should I choose? Got two products and a blog. Doesn't really matter. Doesn't matter. I will I will say this. From what I have seen, um now to be to be fair, I'm I'm slightly spoiled here because I've seen both sides. Uh you'll see a lot of people talk about how uh because of Shopify and how they force a certain link structure on you when you build out your catalog uh, versus WooCommerce and WordPress where you can actually control the link structure. A lot of people will argue that WordPress, WooCommerce is easier for SEO work. Makes sense. Um, it, and that can be the case. But a lot of the people that are saying that are also, I, I don't want to throw shade, um, but they, they're, some of their SEO practices are overly technical and, and some and sometimes gimmicky. Uh, and I say I'm spoiled because not, not to plug or anything, but Chris has a paid program to where if you get things correctly in place and they're all fundamental, let's just say that the Google core updates and worrying about the difference between WooCommerce and Shopify as far as SEO goes, uh, become irrelevant. They really do. And I've, I've been through four or five core updates uh, since arranging things based on how, how he taught me to set things up. To be clear, it was somebody in my course that taught it. I don't know e-commerce at all. So Yeah, no, 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 no. But that's what I'm saying. It, it, it's all part of the Superstar Academy is what I'm talking about. No, uh, that, wasn't, will, that wasn't for you. That was for... Okay. Yeah, no. But I, I, will, I will say this. As far as WooCommerce versus Shopify, the trade-off is this. Uh, I, I prefer Shopify myself because if I have a hiccup on the platform, there's a support team. Yeah. That's it's why I prefer Shopify. Yeah. I, I, I've used both. I prefer Shopify too. I found WooCommerce to actually be very infuriating to get used to. So, all right. Uh, Sandra says, great interview. Thank you, Sandra. Glad to have you. Glad to have you. Marcel says, follow-up question. 
Uh, hi, Stephen. A follow-up question. How about offer the Shopify customer to buy the product within Shopify itself or at Amazon? So you offer to buy now. Don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. You need people to understand exactly what they're supposed to do within one second of looking at the screen from 10 feet away. That's the test. And I get that actually as an inside like that's how Google does their, their, their usability testing. When one of the engineering departments puts together a landing page, they bring somebody in from the other, from the other department that knows nothing about it. And they send them 10 feet away from the monitor and say, what are we supposed to do on this page? And the person's supposed to instantly answer. And if they can't damn near instantly answer, scrap it. It's not good enough. And here's the thing. Go to Google. Do you want to search for something or would you like vanilla ice cream? Like, let me, you know what? I'm going to do something right now. I, for those of you that are watching, you'll be able to see this. And for everybody just listening, I'll make sense of it anyway. All right. So here's what we call choice architecture. And this is actually behavioral engineering. This is some of the psychology stuff that I use in my marketing. All right. So in my hand, if you're watching this, you can see this. But in my hand, I have a green marker, a blue marker, and a yellow marker. And they're all three right next to each other. If I asked you, uh, Chris, what color marker do you want? The process with which you make your choice is going to be very, very different if instead I hold up a blue marker with the green and the yellow underneath it, and I say, hey, Chris, would you like a blue marker? Alternatively, you could get yellow or green. You're going to say, oh, well, blue marker's fine. It's a reflex versus thinking about it. When you go to Amazon.com, you see one button. It says buy now. Yeah. It does it not is. say add to cart. It does not say buy now. It does not say add to list. It does not say save for later. It says buy now. It's a usability thing. Yeah, they That's did a, the a idea. study of, a few years back and they talked about how many millions of dollars a year they lose per click. Like the, the more clicks they can remove from the process, the more millions of dollars a year, probably billions yep. Yep. <laughs> that they make. So That's huge. Yeah. Uh, Marcel says, thank you, Stephen. Vladimir says, do you suggest creating landing pages for best sellers or drive traffic directly to product page? Uh, I would use landing pages when I bundle best sellers to drive higher average order value on the site. Okay. Can you even drive like paid traffic directly to Amazon? You can, but not with a conversion objective. Okay, I didn't. I didn't know if Facebook even allowed that, like, to use. No, it no, no, no. And here, and oh, you, you, yeah, you can. You absolutely can. But I know what he's asking because I, I know Vladimir. I'm very good friends with him. Um, but I, I would use if I have somebody that want to drive back to a product page. Don't make them think. Give them back to the product page. Here's what you want with the checkout button. There you go. If instead I'm saying, you know, if I have an ad running 20% off, you know, this product because we know you were looking at it. Ooh, I waited. I'm so clever. 20% off. Uh-uh. 20% off when you buy three. Ooh. Oh, I really want it. And I know I could get more for, okay, fine. I'll buy the bundle. What the hell? That's when you use a landing page versus a product page on your site. Because, because now, now it makes sense from a usability standpoint. That's the idea. Oh, I did, I, alternatively, if you were going to run like a social contest or you're going to try to run like a squeeze page and give a discount because they're in the club because they gave you their email, yeah, you can do that. You can totally do that because the landing page acts the same as a light box pop-up where he says, hey, join, join the club. We'll give you 10% off any order in our store just because you're on the email list. Like if you want to do that to squeeze people for email so you can work that channel, sure. And honestly, email marketing is a huge revenue generator that is so neglected by so many people from all marketing spheres. Yes. And it's ridiculous. It's so crazy. Like, honestly, this is what, this is what gets people. If you get your, your, your flows moving, they can be decent. That's 30% of your revenue. So if you did, if you did a hundred grand in revenue last year, what if you could have added 30 grand? That's a huge difference. What if you had a million dollars in revenue and you could add 300,000 just by sending proper emails and working that working that channel properly? Mm -hmm. My revenue last year, email was 38% of my revenue. Huge. 
It can also be a, you need to buy, it, it's a quick cash influx. You know, your hot water heater breaks at your house. Let me go write an email to pay for that. You know, email, it, it, there's no way to get instant cash as quickly as a good, a good email list if you need to. And I don't mean that to sound disrespectful to the people on the list, you know, because you're still going to offer no, no. something that's valuable. But if you need money like right away, that's there's no faster way to reach a bunch like thousands of people at once. And honestly, and instead of just running offers to your email list, it shouldn't be just another sales page. You have to send your trust builders and you have oh, to yeah. send your your passion pursuit regular content because it gives people a reason to continually re-engage. And mm -hmm. then if you make your offers exclusive to your email list, even if they know they're going to come out on the page, but it's like a couple of weeks ahead of time, now they have a reason to be on the email list. Mm -hmm. There you go. And honestly, yeah. people will respond to you from your, from even your drip feed emails. And if you respond back to those emails personally, huh, you have somebody that's hugely brand loyal because they know they're not going to get that from every company. Yeah. I don't do that because I've gotten too many nasty emails, unfortunately, but you're right. I, I have, yeah. I have at least four different sequences run that there you go. It's just YouTube videos that I send them. So, and but, it works. Yeah, but it, like, works. it can, like I said, it can also be just a, a traffic bomb too. If you need somebody to do something right away, it's funny because people think email is dead, and it's absolutely not. <laughs> Let them keep thinking that. I don't have to compete yeah. with those people. We'll do one more question, and I know you have some time that you got to get get out yeah. of here. So we'll do one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. We got Marcel. He says, "Hi, Chris. When SEO, I'm assuming he means applied well. How much?" percent could you increase sales on Amazon? It's kind of, I can't really answer the number, but if you apply it well, you're definitely going to get more. I mean, it, I can't really answer how much because it just depends on the keyword and the product and whatever, but it's, and more, it, it, I think the spirit of that question, is it worth doing? And the answer is yes. Yeah. And here, here's the cool thing, Marcel, for all the keywords that you're you're indexed for on the Amazon platform that maybe you're showing for organically or even you're bidding on for PPC, you can expand all of those onto your 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 content and try to get ranked for them on Google. So now if people are finding you on Google, these are people that are not necessarily searching the Amazon platform. The reach that Google has versus Amazon like it's, it's not comparable. People mm -hmm. think that Amazon is this big, huge trillion dollar company thing. Like they're not even allowed to get in the pool compared to Google. As far as search goes, as far as e-com goes, yeah, they're 5% of the retail market and they're 50% of the online market here in the United States only. You have to give that context, but as the search market goes, like it's, it's, I, I, I it, it has to be more than a hundred to one yeah. as far as the actual search volume that, and, and the reach that Google has for search versus Amazon. And the other cool thing you have to realize in the very, very, very beginning of the conversation, Chris and I talked about targeted keywords versus peripheral keywords. If I'm selling sleep aid as my targeted keyword, because it's product centric, I can write an article on my site. That's the five best sleeping tips, you know, 10 things keeping you up at night, the real reason you think you have insomnia. And these are all keywords that relate to my natural sleep aid that could lead people in that people are searching for that don't cost anything. And now you can expand this huge reach on Google to drive more people to your Amazon listing and teach them what to search for, or just have them click through to your listing much, much, much better. And your competitors are lazy and they're not going to want to do it. This is why you see the Amazon uh, strategies littered with giveaways and rebates and gimmicks and everything else. And all that points to is that people are desperate to make any kind of money they can, and they're not going to put in the real work to make a real ecosystem to drive people to their brand and drive people to their touch points and then nurture those leads into, into buyers. So if you do SEO, you're going to bring all those people in that your competitors are not. If it's affiliate links or if it's blog articles or if it's getting indexed, you know, for, for, for all these different other keywords that are related, that's easy to do. A tool that you can use to look up um, other keywords that I like is uh, LSI graph, latent semantic index keywords. These are words that, uh, that, that Google says, hey, here's your keyword. These are other keywords that relate to it. And it shows you what content is trending 
uh, on Google Trends for the last 12 months. You can you can export that. It shows you uh, how many social shares across multiple platforms each article is getting and what the top shared articles are for that keyword and for the other peripheral keywords around it. Great little tool to find other words to expand your presence and start writing content and drive people from Google to your Amazon listings. It's so easy to do, but people are lazy and they're not going to make the effort. You should if you like money. Yeah. BuzzSumo is similar to that too. Buzz oh, Sumo. man, I love BuzzSumo. That's one of my favorites. I love BuzzSumo. Not for everybody, if we're honest, because when you get onto it, it's 100 bucks a month. But And the, you, the level I have is 300 bucks a month. Well, there, there you go. But what I'm saying is it, once you start committing to making consistent content, mm -hmm. it's not worth it to not have that 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 tool. That tool is so vital. It's an, it's amazing. And it takes the place of so many other tools. It's fantastic. I love that tool. Yeah. For content marketing, it's it's another world. The Facebook uh, analyzer is, is huge. So yeah. I was actually in the process of making a plugin for a while that would create websites based on the trending topics and like auto generate wow. from it, but it was too much. Their, their API is ridiculous expensive. So Oof. Yeah, I, I there, we this, there just didn't seem to be that much interest to justify it. There we go. Uh, let's see. Awesome. Thank you, Stephen and Chris for delivering amazing value. Thumbs up. All right. And we are out of questions and that's good because I know you need to run. If people wanted to get to talk to you some more or connect with you, where should they go? Uh, if you want to connect with me some more, there are two things that you can do very, very easy. Um, you can look up on Facebook, unstoppable FBA. Uh, and Just, uh, let me interrupt you real quick. To, to get to that group easier. You can go to superstarseo.com slash Steven, and that'll take you right to that Facebook group. There you go. Yeah, I anticipated that answer. There you go. That, yeah, that's right. honestly the easiest way to get a hold of me, um, to get into the group. You do have to answer the three questions up front. If you don't answer the three questions up front, I will not let you in. You will not talk to me. Um, I don't even ask for your email. They're really, really easy, really, really easy questions. It's just to keep the bots and the spammers away. Um, uh, uh, alternatively, you can email me at info, I-N-F-O, at unstoppablefba.com. And I have a website. It's unstoppablefba.com. You can contact me through there. You can see articles I've written on the subject. The whole deal. Very, very easy. All right. Anything else you would like to say? Or oh, I'm just so glad that I I, I I was on the podcast. I was very honored to be asked. I've 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 you know followed your work and your advice for so long, and I've done so much with it. I'm I'm just glad to be able to give back in any way I can. I appreciate that. I uh, I wanted to have you on because you have a unique skill set and perspective from some of the. Nothing. No offense to anybody else. It's been yeah. on. It's just not another SEO guest. I'm right. Gonna, to kind of like diversify this this year. And I was going through my friends list and I only picked out about five people and you, you were one I thought that would have some value and you were a great guest because I didn't have to say very much. So <laughs> I didn't have to ask very many questions. So. I, I like sharing Any, anybody <laughs> that, that anybody that comes to my group, if you ask a question, you're, you're going to get answers. It's, it's not a canned answer and then a sales pitch. You will see next to no sales pitches of any variety for anything in my group. And we're about 10,000 strong now. Uh, and what's really, really fun. I, I will tip my own hat here. We have so much engagement that Facebook North America reached out to me and said, what are you doing for the engagement rate in your group? It's bonkers. How many answers you'll get in my group awesome. about anything. And it's all, it's all marketing related. Um, I talk about the Amazon platform. If you want to talk about the off Amazon platform, I am okay to talk about whatever you want to throw my way. Awesome. And so is everybody else. And lots of experts in there too. It's not just me. I have a lot of people from all different backgrounds. I have people that have worked with Fortune 500 companies. I have, you know, people that are like mid eight figure brand owners in there. I mean, if you want to know about a subject, come and ask. Would love to have you. All right. All right. I think that's good. I think we'll wrap it up. Uh, we'll be back next week. I haven't, don't, well, I'm not going to say for sure next week because I'm moving offices later this month and I may not have time. But we'll be back soon, by we, I mean me, with another guest. And hopefully we'll have Stephen on again sometime in the future. So thanks, everybody, for signing up. We had a great turnout today. And I'm re that really makes me happy. I get very frustrated when people don't show up. So I'm very glad that we had a lot of people show up today. I hope you enjoyed it. And most importantly, figure out what you want out of life and go out and do it because you owe it to yourself and you owe it to the world. Thanks a lot, everybody, and I'll talk to you again soon.